Good morning, everybody. Uh, glad that you're joining us online for our Bible class this morning. Uh, we're going to get started here. I I've got a lot, actually, to try to cover. I honestly don't know uh, how far I'll get. Uh, I've never taught what I'm about to teach this morning, so I really have no idea how long it will last. I think it's somewhere maybe between 15 minutes and six hours. So, uh, but we won't go six hours, I promise you that. Um, so today's lesson is the beginning really of a series of thoughts that I've been putting together over uh, the past several years to uh, consolidate, if you'll allow me to use that terminology, what the Bible is telling us. So I've entitled uh, this study, What the Bible is All About. Uh, and as I mentioned, it started out uh, a few years ago in the teen class when I was teaching uh, with, the, with the goal being to hopefully get into their minds one sentence that they could associate with each of the books of the New Testament. Uh, for example, the, the book of James uh, can be remembered with a sentence of faith that is alive does something. And so I wanted to try to put those kind of uh, thoughts out there for them and, and this uh, study kind of just evolved uh, from from that so if time permits we'll, we'll get to those points um, in, in a little bit later on uh, in our lesson um, and so uh, with the teen class I, I, that's what I entitled that that study we did that quarter is what's what's the Bible all about um, how's it all connected uh, in other words what's the big picture Said, I don't know if we'll finish, but uh, if we don't, we'll find a good place to stop and we'll pick back up uh, at some, some other time. Let me give you a quick tease, uh, if I can, into that title, What the Bible's All About, by starting with something that Paul wrote. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it's a passage that we're all familiar with, Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, and to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Um, so the gospel is Christianity's foundation. Christianity stands on the gospel and nothing else. Um, it alone is the centerpiece. There are many adjectives we can use to describe the gospel. It's beautiful, it's powerful, it's motivating, it's emotional, it's life-changing. It's incredible, it's unifying. Uh, think about communion. Communion is all about the gospel. And it's free. And because the gospel is the centerpiece of Christianity, it really should occupy that same centerpiece position in our lives, in the lives of believers. Believers should be frequently reminded of the gospel, this salvation producing message. And as such, the gospel is not just for those who are lost. It's just as much for believers. And it's of great importance that believers are reminded of the gospel on a frequent basis, lest we begin to place other thoughts and concepts above what is contained in the gospel. We cannot take the gospel lightly, nor can we take it for granted. And we can't miss the fact that it's not about us. It's about Jesus. So let's talk a minute about the gospel. What is it? The original classical definition of the Greek noun for gospel uh, was a reward for bringing a good message. The term stood for the message itself. And it became a general term used for the triumphant message from the battlefield. It was used for joyous political proclamations or for personal messages of good news. It was a term for news of victory. That's the Greek definition of the word. So with respect to Christianity, we're aware of what this good news message is. God sent his son for salvation, to pay the price for sin, to provide forgiveness for sin and give eternal life. In other words, sin and death have been defeated. And the gospel message is the good news of that victory. 
The gospel has been called the essential, essential doctrine of, of the Bible. And the idea of salvation has many aspects that we don't have time to go, to, go into today. Uh, and there are really a lot of extensive studies that can be done. Some of these things are topics like grace and faith, baptism, forgiveness, justification, sanctification, righteousness, mercy, reconciliation, eternal life. There are, there are a lot of other things that are connected to this idea of salvation. But because of its position of being the focal point of the word that God has given us, the gospel should be preached and taught constantly. And its understanding should be continually exhibited in the lives of the believers, which is the primary purpose for the letters of the New Testament to explain how we should live. Since the essential doctrine of the Bible is salvation by grace through faith, we should understand that that means the entire Bible, both Old and New Testaments, point to it. So the questions that we'll begin with this morning are why is salvation needed and from what are we being saved? And in answering these questions, we will see what the Bible is all about. Many people believe that the Bible is uh, an account of the beginning and end of time. Uh, Genesis reveals creation and the beginning of time, and Revelation reveals the coming of Jesus Christ and, and the end of time. And, and perhaps that's an appropriate perspective to take. But with this perspective on the Bible, some people will be uh, tempted to say things, well, I don't understand what those Old Testament prophets are talking about. I can't understand that stuff. Or why do I care about all those stories that have people in them whose names I can't even pronounce? Well, what does some obscure story in the Old Testament have to do with me being a Christian? So the Bible is not a history book per se, but it is a book of history. But let me submit to you, if, if you allow, what I believe is, is a more accurate assessment of what the Bible is about. The Bible begins with Genesis, revealing the account of creation, including man as the crown jewel. It continues with the story of his downfall, his fall from a relationship with God, how a plan was put into place to redeem him, and how salvation and restoration back to that relationship with God rests in Jesus Christ alone. And that finally, in the revelation, the description of the outcome that comes to those who refuse to accept Jesus, who reject the gospel, and who choose to be antagonistic toward the way of Christ. Genesis introduces the story. The books in between give us insight and glimpses into God's nature, tell how the Messiah was to come, how he came, what he taught, his exceptional act of redemption. And the Revelation closes the story with the images of a triumphant king who has an everlasting kingdom, consisting of those who are continually praising him, are faithful to him, and who live forever in his presence. A story that begins in paradise and quickly descends into one of failure and what seems to be an irreparable loss ultimately ends with deliverance, salvation for those who believe in Jesus, the Son of God. They believe in his atoning death on the cross and his triumphant resurrection and that there's punishment and ultimate elimination of those who reject him. And he is pronounced in his undeniable position as king of kings. So in essence, what I'm saying is that the entire Bible is about the gospel. It's about salvation. The entire Bible provides the backbone, if, if you will, for the message of salvation and includes thousands of stories and applications for understanding who God is, what his nature is, and what his plan is for saving mankind. So a summary of the gospel. Everybody knows this verse. Believers and non-believers alike know this verse. Everybody's probably memorized it from when you were a kid. And it's a verse that's packed with incredible, uh, with incredible thoughts. And that, that's John 3.16. For God so loved, 1 John 4.8 says God is love. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him and in Acts 4 and 12 there's no other name by which men are saved should not perish but have everlasting life that is a high level picture of salvation and there's a lot of details that uh, go along with with what this verse is about but that tells you who's doing the saving why he did it who it is that can receive it how that salvation comes and what happens to those who accept it and believe it so the wording of of John 3 16 includes a lot of a lot of other points that are made in other places in, in the Bible in Isaiah 53 and 5 um, the idea of Jesus being pierced for our transgressions Mark 10 45 Jesus gave his life as a ransom we have forgiveness of sins told to us in Acts 13, 38 through 39. Jesus was raised for our justification, Romans 4, 25. Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Christ died, was buried, and rose, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. Christ redeems us from all wickedness, Titus 2, 14. We are saved by his mercy, Titus 3, 4 through 7. Jesus was sacrificed for our sins, Hebrews 9, 28, 1 John 4 and 10. Jesus brought us to God, 1 Peter 3, 18. All of these ideas are included in John 3, 16. This is the gospel, John 3, 16. She gets a little, she gets a little notoriety for it, but listen to Martha in John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is, is the account where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And he's talking with Mary, and he makes this statement to her. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Mary's answer is, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. So John 3.16 is the gospel, and John 11.27 is the understanding of the gospel. We don't hear much about Martha's confession there, but that is, is a powerful statement she made. So we come to the realization that the entire Bible uh, is focused on the gospel. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. This statement implies that the entire Bible is about Jesus. So we, we need to understand the Bible is about salvation. It's about the gospel. And we need to understand the fact that salvation is through Jesus. And that is the fundamental and central message being delivered. And that message is laid out for us in its pages. So that's the introduction uh, to, to what we're going to talk about. Our next section is going to be, I would entitle it, Choices and Consequences. So let's go back to the two questions we asked earlier. Why is salvation needed? And from what are we being saved? So we start at the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, what happened in the garden. And we see this idea of choices and consequences. So prior to the events in, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we know that God interacted with Adam. He gave him instructions. He told him to tend the garden. He told him to name the animals. And God also gave Adam definition. He said, do not eat of a certain tree. So God drew a box, basically, for Adam and for Eve. All the trees, with one exception, are placed inside that box and can be eaten. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil was placed outside that box. It cannot be eaten. And God told Adam in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So philosophically speaking, uh, there can be no right without wrong. Uh, we have the, the opposites of inside the box and outside the box, if you want to look at it that way. 
And Paul uh, confirms that thought in, in Romans 5 and 13. He says, uh, sin is not imputed, which means it's not reckoned or it's not attributed when there is no law. So if there's no definition, there's no law, there's no sin. But God plainly defined what was acceptable behavior and what was not for Adam and Eve. Paul would later write in Romans 3 and 20, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In Romans 7, verse 7, he says, I would not have known sin except through the law. So the law defines what is right and what is wrong. God defined what was right and what was wrong for Adam and Eve. He told them, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So everything's all well and good until Adam and Eve are confronted with temptation. And they have to choose. They have to make a choice. They didn't have a choice not to choose. So we know that Eve was deceived by the serpent, and she chose to eat. And that put Adam in a position really to have to choose between God and between the woman that was made for him. And he chose Eve and he ate. So there's all kinds of lessons that we can look at in this series of events that we just we don't really have time for. Uh, but we will just suffice it to say at this point Adam and Eve disobeyed and a penalty has to be imposed for that disobedience. So now there's a problem, a big problem. Innocence is lost, relationship with God is lost, eternal life is lost, and it's not lost just for Adam and Eve, but it's lost for all mankind because of the weakness of the flesh. Paul would later write to the Roman church in Romans 7 and verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me but the doing of the good is not. Now what a powerful testimony that right there is to the inability of man to do what he knows is right. And in this capacity, man is helpless. It's not his inability to know what is right, but rather in his inability to do what is right. And we see Paul wrestle with that very thought in Romans chapter 7. And it's a struggle for all of us, knowing what to do, knowing what's right to do and, and, and doing it. So Adam and Eve chose to disobey, and that caused two things to be imposed as a penalty. Both of them are related to the idea of separation. There's a physical death. And there's a spiritual death. Physical death is separation, obviously, from physical life. Spiritual death is a separation from God. It's a loss of the Holy Spirit. And this is the answer to our two questions. This is why salvation is needed. And it is, this is what we are saved from. We are saved from the spiritual death. Adam's and Eve's sin gave it a foothold in the world, and thus it affects every human born since. We're prone to sin. Look at these words in the book of Romans. Paul says in Romans 3, 10 through 12, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5 and 12, therefore just as through one man sin entered, came into being, into the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men. All sin. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as the, though through one trespass, which is Adam's uh, trespass, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. So we can think we're good people all day long. But that doesn't change the fact that we're all included in the none and the all in those verses that I just read. Being a good person does not solve this problem. So point number three is what now? Man is, man is helpless in this matter. He, he can't repair the damage himself. 
There's nothing he can do to reverse what happened. And now the choice is God's. Because of God's nature, he will only choose what is right. So God has two options. Option one, he can do nothing. He can allow his creation to remain separated from him forever and ultimately suffer complete and eternal destruction. Or he can act to repair his creation. And God's love for his creation causes him to choose to do something. It is God's character of grace that causes him to reach out and save his creation. There are two things that, that we're dealing with here. Physical death and spiritual death. Physical death is one thing. Spiritual death is totally different concept. So immediately after God confronts Adam and Eve about their sin, we see a plan start to form. Someone is coming. In Genesis 3.15, God speaks to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. That is a reference to Jesus in the third chapter of Genesis. And at this point, moving forward through the Old Testament, we begin to see God making promises with man. He made a promise with Noah in Genesis 6. He made a promise with Abraham in Genesis 15 in, in chapter 17. He made a promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob recorded in Exodus 32. He made a promise with Jacob in Exodus 2 and in Exodus 6 and in Leviticus 26. He made promises with the Israelites in Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 5. He made a promise of covenant with Moses in Exodus 34. He made a promise or a covenant with Phineas, Aaron's son, in Numbers 25. Many people get hung up on the physical promises that God made. You see it in those who believe that the Jews should still be living in Palestine. That's their promised land. The Jews are still God's chosen people. But I'll tell you that the ultimate covenant, the ultimate promise, can't be about the physical aspects of what happened in the garden because that's not the most significant issue that must be addressed. The most, the most significant issue to be addressed is the spiritual one, man's separation from God. God has a plan ready, and he makes these earthly promises to show us that he is a promise keeper. So if God keeps his promise for the physical things that we can see, then we can trust him to keep the promises for the spiritual things that we can't see. God begins to establish the fact that he indeed keeps his promises. He also begins to establish the fact that punishment remains in place for those who refuse to obey. God will provide a way for the someone he referred to in his response to the serpent. He chooses a man to begin a line of people to bring this someone into the picture. And we know that man was Abraham. The fourth point I want to make is, is, is we, we see in the Old Testament pictures, if you will, of God and Christ. And I'm going to go through these really quickly so we can uh, get finished here, hopefully. Uh, but we see pictures of what God intends to do. We see Noah. We see judgment there. We see water involved. We see salvation comes from being inside of something. There's only one entrance into the vehicle that provides salvation. The old world is destroyed. A new world is in place. Those ideas should be familiar to us in the New Testament. Take the book of Job, probably the oldest book in the Bible. Job has his possessions taken from him without the commission of any sin. Job realizes he needs a mediator when he is in his conversations with God. Job chapter 9, 32 and 33, God, uh, Job says, uh, God is not a man as I am that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There's no umpire between us who may lay his hands on both of us. This emphasizes the fact that a separation has occurred between God and his creation, and there's no one who can bridge the gap. Job realizes that a redeemer is needed. In, in Job chapter 19, he, he makes a statement, I know that my Redeemer lives. So again, we have an emphasis on this someone who will come 
and make things right. We see Abraham, whose belief was counted as righteousness. We see the story of him offering Isaac. Uh, we understand his faith. We understand that uh, God asked Abraham to offer his only son, basically, as a sacrifice. And, and we see Isaac actually carrying the wood for the sacrifice, just like Jesus carried the wood for his sacrifice. We see Joseph, who suffered at the hands of his own people, just like Jesus did. He was kind to those who mistreated him. His own people hated him and rejected him. He went through a period of wrong suffering, but he was raised to a prominent position in Pharaoh's administration. He forgave his brothers and their family, providing for them and, and saving their lives. That, again, that's a, a, a beautiful picture of Jesus. We see Moses, a leader of God's people, leads them out of bondage. He's the deliverer. Uh, we see the idea and the concept of Passover being covered by the blood. Moses becomes an advocate for the people. All of these things we see in, in the Old Testament are borne out in Jesus. We see animal sacrifices. We see that sacrifices are, are required. And there's not time for us to talk about the tabernacle and the way, the way it was used or to talk about Joshua or David. Uh, but you get the idea that there are many, many pictures of what God's plan is in the Old Testament. Point number five I want to make, I, I entitled this, What is Wrong with These People? And that's the children of Israel. And if, if you read through the Old Testament, you know that they exhibited a pattern of rebellious behavior. Why do these people so easily leave God and move into idolatry? You know, the judges are brought in to bring them back in the right relationship. Uh, kings are set up. You know, after the Saul, David, and Solomon, the nation's divided, and, and there's multiple kings on both kingdoms that are, are evil and wicked and lead the people astray. Eventually both those kingdoms are taken into captivity. So what picture does this paint for us? One, it, it, it paints the picture that we're prone to wonder. Think about the times that you've repeated sinful behavior. It points out the fact that we need a patient judge, somebody who's willing to give us another chance. We understand also that there's punishment for continued sinful behavior. And we really need someone who can do something about our weakness, our propensity to wander away. Next we come to the prophets. What are these guys talking about? What are the prophets talking about? In general, the prophets warn people about uh, continued disobedience, but a, a lot of them, uh, many of them talk about the coming Messiah. Isaiah. In Isaiah 7, Isaiah 53, and Isaiah 60 through 66, he talks about the Messiah, the someone who's coming. Jeremiah, in 30, chapter 31, talks about the new covenant. Hosea uh, gives an incredible picture of God's love for his people. In, in, in that book, God makes the statement, my heart beats for you, talking about his love and his care for his people, regardless of, of the fact that they continually disappoint and, and wander away from him. Daniel speaks of an everlasting kingdom made without hands. Ezekiel prophesies of God giving his people a new heart and a new spirit. Jonah declares God's grace to all men. Remember Jonah went to the city of Nineveh, of the Assyrians. Those were not God's people, but yet God had mercy and, and his grace was extended to them as well. The list goes on and on. So we see that the Old Testament is continually pointing to the coming of the Messiah. He is the someone that God said would come. Let me wrap up here real quickly. I know I've gone long, but I want to get this point in. The New Testament we're a whole lot more familiar with. I want to call your attention to the Gospel of John. John chapter 3 through about John chapter 11. Jesus is continually uh, making a point. Uh, and I don't have time to get into the specifics of Jesus and Nicodemus' conversation or Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Um, or in John chapter 5, Jesus talking with the Jews who wanted to kill him. Uh, John chapter 6 is Jesus talking to the crowd after he has fed the 5,000. John chapter 7 
is Jesus talking to the Jews at the temple. Uh, John 8, he's talking to the adulterous woman. John 9, he's talking to a blind man. Uh, all the way up through John chapter 17. Every one of those chapters, Jesus makes the statement or, or uh, refers to being sent. As a matter of fact, in those chapters, he makes the statement that he has been sent 38 times. 38 times. 16 out of the 21 chapters in the book of John have Jesus making that statement. So it's clear that Jesus came to do his Father's will. He was sent. He is the someone who clearly fulfills what God said would happen in Genesis chapter 3. We don't have time to, to go through uh, the, the New Testament. Uh, maybe there will be another opportunity where we can look at these uh, one-sentence summaries that, that I put together for uh, the, the letters that Paul and Peter and John and Jude and James, those guys wrote uh, that, that help support the idea of the gospel is what saves us. It is so important to uh, us. It, it has to be central. It has to be focused on. Um, and, and, and it really needs to be the main part of our life. We should never forget it. We should never take it for granted. Uh, we should never try to place ourselves above what Jesus did for us as part of uh, his role in uh, the, the plan of salvation. I appreciate your attention this morning. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully have another opportunity later on to look at the New Testament in uh, the letters that are written with respect to the gospel.